All right, I think um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, just to remind you all, uh, this is Beck. Welcome. Uh, we meet every Monday from 12 to 1.30 here in this room. There will be a sign-in sheet, which if you did not sign it by the food outside uh, gets passed around, please sign in if you have not. If you were not on our mailing list and heard about today's event through some other means, Please, and would like to be on our mailing list, please provide your email address on the sign-in sheet and we will add you. Um, other things. Um, lunch is $6. Please pay us if you haven't. And um, what? <coughs> lunch is subject to a donation if you so choose <laughs> and feel moved. If you feel so moved. Um, I'd also like to say that as uh, part of a land-grant institution, the Center for Behavior, Evolution, and Culture at UCLA acknowledges our presence here on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabriel Tongva peoples. What would you like to say before our talk? Uh, we're going to give you a little update about future events. Uh, we only have one more talk this quarter, which will be next Monday, December 2nd where uh, Max Kleinman Weiner from MIT will be visiting us, and he'll be um, talking about some really interesting work on AI and modeling and uh, cooperation. So please come to that. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Caitlin O'Connell, who's visiting us from USC. And um, her talk is entitled, The Costs and Benefits of Sociality Explored in Wild Bornean Orangutans, Hongo Pygmaeus Wormiae. Thank you very much. Thanks so much uh, to all of you for being here today, especially so close to a holiday. Um, I am going to just be giving basically an overview of um, my research today, uh, hopefully some of my more interesting findings, um, and all focused on the sociality of wild Bornean orangutans. So sociality, first of all, broadly speaking, um, is the degree to which members of a species decide to spend time together or not, how cohesive um, members of a species are or are not, what type of social organization do they form. There are many different ways that organisms arrange themselves, uh, everything from solitary carnivores to pair-bonded birds, herd-living undulates. Um, when you look across the animal kingdom, you see animals arranging themselves in myriad ways. When we look at the primate order, we see a general tendency towards sociality. Um, primates tend to form groups, and they tend to have lots of interactions amongst group mates. Uh, they seem to use sociality as an adaptation. It's actually really important for them in terms of their ability to survive and reproduce successfully. Um, one of the ways that we uh, sort of unifying theories is how we explain both uh, explain and predict the ways that primates group themselves is the socio-ecological model. Um, this is just one rendering from Koenig and Collies in 2013, kind of a summary of what the socio-ecological model is. You have various ecological factors, uh, everything from the nature and the distribution of food across the environment, um, predation risk, uh, everything from actual predators, animals, uh, being eaten to also uh, things like parasites and other diseases. Um, and then social risks, things like sexual coercion. And all of these factors will sort of interact and have an influence on the relative costs and benefits for a particular species to form groups uh, or not. And then, of course, dictate the nature of the relationships inside those groups should they be formed. Uh, when we look at the order primates, uh, given that they inhabit lots of different uh, geographic areas uh, and different types of habitat, we see lots of different social systems within primates, everything from solitary lemurs in Madagascar, you have group living, multi-male, uh, multi-female groups of white-faced capuchins in Costa Rica, uh, fission fusion societies uh, in chimpanzees across Africa, um, and then you have uh, really complex societies like multi-level societies as we see in geladas, uh, hamadryas baboons, and of course we also see that in humans. So when we look then at the order of primates, uh, we can break primates down, of course, into these, um, into these suborders, the strepsorines and the haplorines. Uh, and when we look at strepsorines, these are things like lemurs and lorises, uh, generally smaller brained-ish things uh, compared to the haplorines. And you also see 
in these families, the ones with the stars there on the side, um, these are families of primates that are made up either exclusively or largely of solitary species. So these are less social primates, even though sociality in general is kind of a primate feature. Uh, you have lots of solitary species in there. And then when we compare that to haplorines, uh, you have a near absence of solitary species, uh, except of course for the tarsiers. And then not again until you get down uh, into the great apes and you have it in the genus Pongo, or the orangutans. So this is weird. Orangutans are weird, certainly in comparison to most haplorines. Um, orangutans, I think a very meaningful distinction, as I'll elaborate on today, is that they are semi-solitary, not fully solitary. Um, but we basically attribute the fact that they are less gregarious than the other apes to the fact that they are large in body size, so they have high energetic requirements to sustain those bodies. Um, and they inhabit forests um, that are known for being low in fruit production overall, and these are sort of preferred fruit eaters. Um, Southeast Asian rainforests are less productive uh, overall compared to African rainforests. Um, and there's also an interesting feature that is characteristic of Southeast Asian rainforests, this masting. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. Um, essentially, these events are unpredictable in terms of timing. Um, they tend to follow sort of El Nino events, so every four to seven years-ish, um, but that can be quite variable. Uh, you have these events, a masting event is, it feels like every single tree in the forest is fruiting at the same time. Lots of species are producing fruit, um, so seed predators are not able to, to access all of, uh, all of the fruit uh, that is being produced at one time. But you have these incredible, like, productive periods that are followed by multi-year, uh, really barren periods. Some years where you have very, very little fruit being produced in the forest, and this big-bodied fruit eater is basically reduced to having to eat things like bark um, and, and leaves, uh, really low quality, difficult to digest material. So for this reason, it is thought that they simply can't afford, energetically speaking, uh, to associate with each other more regularly. Uh, in fact, Certainly upon my initial review of the orangutan literature, uh, my impression is that they were really kind of socially averse. That orangutans don't like each other. They come together only when they absolutely must uh, in contexts like, of course, they have to come together to mate. Um, and they might come together when they have to because maybe only one tree is fruiting in the area. So individuals will sort of be forced to come into the same tree just to, to forage for the day. Um, and so certainly uh, upon my initial visit to the forest to study orangutans, I was very surprised to see lots of social associations outside of the mating context and outside of the context of there only being a single fruiting tree. Um, individuals were congregating um, in various fruit trees, um, so it didn't seem necessary, certainly. Uh, individuals were coming together and coordinating their travel and moving around together, not just over the course of an entire day, but over, over the course of several days. Um, and all of this outside of the mating context. This wasn't just males and, uh, a male and a female who, who were potentially mating following each other around. This was multiple adult females, a combination of males and females coordinating their behavior. Um, and this really defied my expectations, even though I had, I had read quite thoroughly up on orangutans. Um, to formulate my ideas about them. So this really raised a lot of questions for me, uh, not just about the variation in sociality that we see between different kinds of primates, uh, but the amount of variation in social behavior that we can see within a single species. Uh, so what exactly is going on uh, with orangutans? So I'm interested in understanding uh, what the costs of coming together actually are beyond sort of the risk of feeding competi uh, competition with other individuals. Um, if you're not going to be a terribly social primate, what are the costs of coming together uh, occasionally? Um, and then what then are the benefits of coming together that can outweigh these costs that you experience uh, with these periodic associations with conspecifics? Um, I'm also interested in life history um, and understanding how different life history stages might influence the relative costs and benefits of associating with others. Uh, we shouldn't expect um, all individuals to uh, experience the exact same costs and benefits uh, as a result of being social. Um, life history theory reminds us, of course, that energy is limited. 
Um, and depending on what stage you are at in your life, you have energy that you have to devote to particular uh, activities. If you're a little, a little infant or juvenile, you're going to have to devote a lot of your energy, of course, to just growing and hopefully eventually becoming an adult member uh, of your species. Um, if, you're, if you're a mother, you're going to have to devote a lot of your energy is going to go into um, gestating and lactating for these costly little primate babies. Um, and how much energy you then have left over to devote to other activities like socializing uh, is going to vary based on your life history phase um, and also uh, what sex you are. Um, accordingly, I have found some of my earlier work uh, found that there is a difference in the tendency to socialize amongst the different age sex classes uh, in orangutans. Um, I found, and, and others have found also at their study sites, that adolescent females tend to be the most social age sex class. Um, we're looking here just at the mean predicted probability um, of an individual experiencing a social event during a day-long focal follow. You can see adolescent females here are the most likely to have a social encounter uh, during, uh, during their focal follow days, uh, followed by um, adult females and unflanged males, or similarly likely, um, and then flanged males are the least likely to experience a social event uh, over the course of the day. Um, these findings were not terribly surprising given what people have found um, previously at other study sites, um, but I was particularly interested in this rather social age sex class, the adolescent females. Um, why do they tend to come together more than others, and what is the nature uh, of their social relationships? So my questions that I'll focus on today are first um, to understand the costs that adolescent females, these really social individuals, um, may be suffering as a result of coming together uh, periodically. Um, I'd like to know, are they experiencing uh, these social events as stressful events? Um, and are they at a higher risk of catching diseases, basically? And the best non-invasive way to kind of get at that question is to look at parasite infection. Um, and second, I'm interested in how adolescent females might benefit from these periodic social associations. Um, and to figure that out in this really long-lived species with incredibly long birth intervals, it's hard to figure out um, reproductive success in individuals. So to kind of get at what they might be gaining from these associations, I want to look at who are they actually associating with, um, what other age sex classes do they seem to prefer or not, and what is the nature of the interactions that actually take place during these associations? So I carry my research out uh, in Gunung Palung National Park on the island of Borneo. You can see it indicated there on the red dots in the western part of the island. Um, a long-term uh, study project of the orangutans has been going on there um, essentially for the last 30-ish years. Um, and within the interior of the National Park, we have Chabang Panti Research Station, um, where we have this system of uh, trails and transects, um, which we are lucky to be able to follow to not get too lost in the forest, um, where data is collected constantly. People are out there today, of course, collecting data. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be able to continue to tap into this long-term database. Um, so just to clarify a few of the methods, um, before we move on, I've already kind of used uh, some terms. When I'm talking about adolescent females, um, for my purposes, I am talking about individuals who have achieved ranging independence from their mother, who's sort of the basic social unit in orangutans. Um, these are females who are spending over 50% of their time away from their mother, uh, not in permanent association with her, um, but they have not yet reproduced for the first time. So it's these young, nulliparous females that I'm particularly interested in. Adult females are those that have reproduced, at least for the first time, um, and flanged and unflanged males. Um, I don't know how many of you are terribly familiar with orangutans specifically, um, but we have these two different male morphs. Um, historically, we thought that unflanged males, these guys here, the ones that don't have those fatty cheek pads on the sides of their faces, um, it was originally thought that those were just sort of adolescent males or sub-adult males. They simply hadn't acquired their secondary sex characteristics yet. Um, but upon more and more data collection, we have figured out um, that it's a lot more interesting than that. Uh, some males may never flange. Um, there's no sort of period, there's no uh, 
age at which males tend to flange. It can happen at variable times, or like I said, we think potentially not at all in some individuals. Uh, females tend to prefer those with flanges. Um, they seem to concentrate their, their mating effort when they can conceive in the flanged males. They seem to go towards flanged males if they're being harassed by an unflanged male. So they do seem to be preferred by females. And flanged males are much larger than unflanged males. Um, and so they uh, are always dominant, essentially, uh, to unflanged males. So just a little information as I keep using uh, these different designations about different kinds of males. Um, and just a note about the, the data that I collect, um, day-long focal follows. I know you guys have plenty of primatologists here in the department, um, but essentially uh, with orangutans, our focal follows are from the time they wake up until the time they, they go to sleep at night. You're collecting data on a single individual um, and recording essentially everything that they do and every individual that they might interact with, everything that's done to them or every action that they perform uh, over the course of the day. Um, and it's worth noting that when I talk about social and solitary conditions, um, when we're saying an orangutan is being social or is in a social party, we mean that they are within 50 meters <laughs> of a conspecific, of another independently ranging individual. And I know that always gets laughs at conferences and things. Um, but that is the standard for chimpanzees as well, uh, for, for designating that they're a member of the same social party. Um, so when individuals are sort of basically within, within sight of each other. But within 50 meters, we consider them to be social. Um, so first, I want to take a look at the potential costs of associating uh, for adolescent females. So I want to look at both behavioral and physiological markers of stress uh, under conditions of both social and solitary, like I said, when they are totally alone versus when they're within at least 50 meters of another independently ranging individual. Um, the behavioral marker of stress um, that I have looked at is self-directed behavior, um, essentially like self-scratching, self-grooming, and yawning. Um, these behaviors have been identified as uh, useful behavioral indicators of psychosocial stress or anxiety um, in, uh, across the animal kingdom, really, but certainly uh, within lots of different primate species. Um, humans even do uh, something like this, arguably. Um, and then. I also want to look at uh, the physiological measure, sort of proxy of stress uh, in urinary cortisol. Um, studying wild orangutans, we try to do this as non-invasively as possible. Um, so luckily, we can collect things like urine um, and get lots of interesting information out of there. And cortisol um, serves as an indicator that a stress response has been, has been initiated. And so um, I examine uh, urine samples for cortisol. Um, the morning after they have been social or not. So this is sort of first morning urination um, and whether that's a, a social or solitary sample is based on whether they were social or sol solitary the previous day. So first thing out of the nest, um, just that urine uh, and not uh, any that's produced later in the day. Um, so first, some of the uh, results that I have found Socializing is indeed uh, associated with elevated rates of self-directed behavior. Um, you can see this is sort of the, the whole population uh, data is pulled together. Um, and being social uh, is associated with significantly higher rates of self-directed behavior. Essentially, individuals get scratchier uh, when they are in association with one another versus when they are spending time solitary. Um, and when we separate that out into the different age sex classes, uh, you can see here that it's adolescent females really seem to be the ones sort of responsible uh, for that difference. Adolescent females are significantly scratchier on average compared to each of the other age sex classes, which is interesting, of course, because they are also the most social uh, group of all. Um, and now, bear with me here. This figure is a little bit convoluted, but um, I also wanted to know if the identity of social partners is going to have any effect on kind of how anxiety-inducing a social interaction might be. Um, so here I'm looking at a three-way interaction uh, between the age, sex of the focal individual along here, um, whether or not they were social uh, when that uh, rate of self-directed behavior was taken. And then for this graph, we're looking at whether or not an adolescent female social partner was present. Um, so we can start over here on the left side. This is when no adolescent female social partner is present. Um, and this blue line here means that uh, 
the focal individual was not social at all, so of course there was no adolescent female partner present. Um, but the red line indicates that there was an adolescent female social partner. And you can see four adolescent female focals, when they are in association um, with someone other than another adolescent female, their rate of self-directed behavior is significantly higher. Um, and this is interesting when then you compare on the other side of this graph. Um, when adolescent females are social, but another adolescent female is present, uh, their rate of self-directed behavior is significantly lower. And this is particularly interesting because in this data set, 98% um, of the time when two adolescent females were together, there was also a flanged male or an adult female present. Um, so there seems to be something really interesting going on here and potentially kind of social buffering of these age mates, of, of spending time with an adult female uh, or a flanged male is potentially a rather anxiety inducing, uh, but if you bring another adolescent female with you, it seems to reduce the amount of anxiety, at least as marked by the self-directed behavior uh, in these young nulliparous females, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and so rather than look at the same graph for each of the different age sex class social partners, I can just kind of summarize those findings for you here. Um, as I said, when adolescent females associate together, uh, their rate of self-directed behavior is significantly lower um, than it is when they are in association with any of the other age sex classes. Um, it also is significantly reduced, interestingly, when they associate with unflanged males uh, in comparison to when they are in association with either adult females or flanged males. And of course, when they associate with either of those age sex classes, um, their rate of self-directed behavior actually goes up. So experiencing some sense of anxiety when they're uh, interacting with these kinds of individuals, but not uh, when they're with um, other adolescent females or with unflanged males. Um, so looking then at cortisol, um, I wanted to know if sort of the pattern of self-directed behavior uh, was reflected then in patterns of cortisol when individuals are social versus when they are solitary. Um, and here you can see the data, again, sort of pooled for the whole population. Um, when individuals are social, it is associated with um, a bit of an increase in uh, cortisol levels, though this difference when uh, all of the factors are sort of together in this uh, uh, generalized linear mix model, uh, the, the difference is not statistically significant. But when we separa out, uh, separate out the different age sex classes, um, again, you can see significant differences here. Um, but interestingly, it is not the adolescent females that are experiencing the highest levels of, uh, of cortisol. Um, it is the adult females, and they have significantly higher levels of cortisol on average compared to each of the other age sex classes. And now we're looking essentially at the same thing, but we've separated out for each of the age sex classes um, whether they were social or not. So you can see the, the blue line here is adult females. The green line here is flanged males. Um, and for those two age sex classes, being social is associated with significantly higher cortisol levels. Um, whereas if you're an adolescent female or an unflanged male, uh, being social uh, or not doesn't seem to have any influence uh, on, on your cortisol levels in urine. Uh, so another uh, potential cost of these associations that I wanted to look at was risk of disease transmission. As I said, we try to study these guys non-invasively, and one of the um, uh, fairly easy ways that we can look at potential uh, transmission of diseases to look at uh, fecal parasites. Um, I collected samples uh, during these day-long focal follows and would just take the fresh feces back to camp with me and spend much of my evening uh, analyzing uh, each sample for parasites using simple direct smear uh, and fecal flotation techniques. Um, you're able to observe parasites very quickly without having to transport samples out of the country. Um, you can look at uh, samples in real time and determine what you have going on uh, in, in the feces. Um, I'll go over the parasite findings somewhat briefly, only because at least as it pertains to my questions for today, um, the findings were not that interesting. Um, I essentially found that everyone was kind of effect, uh, infected with everything. I, my, I anticipated that perhaps more social individuals might be at risk of contracting um, parasites more readily. So we might see higher parasite prevalence in adolescent females 
since they do have a lot of lot more social contact than others. Um, that is not actually what I ended up finding. Uh, you can see the adolescent females are in the, the dark blue bar for this uh, to the left here. Um, and essentially they don't have higher parasite prevalence uh, than any of these different parasites. Um, and in Trichuris specifically, a, a particular type of worm, uh, no adolescent females were infected with it at all. Um, a little bit beyond the scope of what I'm focusing on today, um, Trichuris is the one type of parasite that there are significant differences uh, between the different age sex classes. Um, you seem to be most likely to be infected if you're young. Uh, this is actually both infants and juveniles included there. Um, I have no idea why that is yet. It's, it's, I think it's particularly strange that the, their mothers uh, would not also be infected with the, with the exact same parasites, especially one that can be transmitted um, through physical contact. Uh, so it's pretty interesting infants and juveniles who do have a lot of contact with mom are infected where mom is not infected. Um, interestingly, I've spoken with uh, uh, gorilla researchers who have found something similar and they also are not entirely sure how to explain it, but um, I don't know exactly what's happening there. Uh, but stay tuned and perhaps we'll, we'll get to the bottom of that. But essentially, I did not find support for my prediction that sort of increased social contact or increased sociality would lead to differences in parasite prevalence among the age sex classes. Um, I will note, however, that during this data collection period, the population was rather social. Um, fruit availability was rather high. Individuals were coming into contact with each other quite frequently, uh, largely facilitated by these social adolescent females who were basically going around and visiting everybody. Um, so the potential is at least there that they are kind of socially transmitted, um, but we can't really detect differences because everyone was so social that year. Um, I continue to monitor this population uh, to see if under less favorable conditions, if perhaps we do start seeing some differences between the age sex classes, but certainly stay tuned for that. Um, so just to summarize a bit then about the cost of socializing for these adolescent females. Um, are they experiencing psychosocial stress, at least as marked by self-directed behavior? Uh, and yes, indeed, they are. Are they experiencing physiological stress as measured by cortisol? And they don't appear to be, um, at least not in this data set. And are they experiencing increased disease risk as marked by uh, an increased prevalence of intestinal parasites? And also, we have not seen that uh, here in this data set. Um, so kind of shifting then to what are the potential benefits uh, that adolescent females might be gaining from having these uh, associations with others. Um, and first I'd like to look at who are they actually spending their time with. And here you can see uh, each of the uh, different age sex classes, adolescent females are spending most of their social time with adult females. Um, this is fairly unsurprising given that we expect female phylopatry um, in orangutans even though they don't form cohesive social groups. Um, genetic data from other research sites has indicated that there does seem to be female phylopatry. Females are much more likely to be closely related to each other at any study site uh, than are males. Males seem to uh, disperse uh, quite far away uh, from uh, their natal groups because we often don't have any, they don't seem to be related to anybody uh, at, the, at the different study sites. Um, so given some semblance of female phylopatry, uh, you would expect that if you are going to be social, it might make sense you might seek out adult females who are likely to be related to you. Um, and I would also expect that if you are going to seek out an adult female, it won't be just anybody. You would be most likely, perhaps, to seek out your own mother. And we did find support for this um, in that if an adolescent female was associating with an adult female, 82% of the time it was her own mother. Um, and so some, certainly some support uh, for the idea that this population, like others, uh, is female phylopatric. Um, then I was also interested then not in just who the associations actually occur with, but what is actually happening uh, when adolescent females are in association with others. Um, so looking at rates of affiliative versus agonistic behavior. Um, so this is beyond just coming within 50 meters of one another. These are actual sort of behaviors performed either directed at or received from another individual. Um, and unexpectedly, um, it is not the adult females, who of course are more often than not their own mothers, 
uh, where we see most of the affiliative interactions taking place. Most of the affiliation is actually happening between uh, adolescent females and both types of male, both flanged and unflanged. They actually exhibit quite a bit of affiliative behavior with that we don't see when they associate even with their own mothers. Um, who they actually receive quite a bit of agonistic behavior from. Um, so just to look uh, a little more closely at what these associations actually look like, um, when adolescents associate with these unflanged males, um, you see lots of uh, different kinds of affiliative behavior, everything from just sitting in physical contact, friendly touching, expressing interest in food that the, uh, the male is eating, um, tolerated food theft, uh, this would happen quite frequently in these associations. An a, a adolescent female, um, even though she's perfectly capable of, of reaching for the, the next fruit on the tree, she would actually take food out of the male's hand or even right out of his mouth, um, and he would tolerate this behavior. Um, and just general sort of friendly inspecting. These associations were way more affiliative than I had ever anticipated seeing in orangutans at all. Um, there are examples of uh, uh, adolescent female would regularly climb into the lap of the unflanged male and then rest her head on his shoulder. Uh, this is just behavior I certainly never anticipated seeing um, in this semi-solitary ape. Um, this will become even more relevant momentarily. Um, upon closer inspection of this data, uh, there were two adolescent females that seemed to be responsible for essentially all of this incredibly affiliative interaction uh, with unflanged males, which I will um, get back to here. So we already looked at this figure that the majority of the time uh, that adolescent females are associating with adult females, it is their own mother, of course. Um, but if you are an orphan and you don't have the option of spending time with mom, what do you do? Um, so I was coming out a little bit uh, not super clear here. Um, but we have these two females uh, that were basically responsible for all of those associations uh, that were super affiliative with unflanged males. Um, and they are two females that just so happen to not have a mom uh, in the study site. We know for sure that one uh, passed away. We're not entirely sure what happened to the other, but this is a female that has never been in association uh, with an adult female that uh, was, her, was her own mother because she's only ever associated with females that we know for sure. Um, are the mothers of other adolescent females in the area. Um, so if you are one of these two orphans, uh, I would expect as a female phylopatric species that if you don't have the option of associating with mom, uh, that you would instead seek out the company of maybe other adult females, sort of the next best thing, maybe an aunt, maybe a grandmother, other females that are likely to be uh, fairly closely related to you. Um, that's not what we're seeing here, uh, and again, these sample sizes are perhaps not terribly impressive, um, but really interesting, certainly, when we look at those two orphans, they are basically expressing the exact opposite of the social strategy of other adolescent females. They are spending, instead, the majority of their time in association with adult, fe uh, adult males instead of other adult females. Um, and, of course, a lot of those associations, as I said, are incredibly affiliative. Um, this is interesting when we consider the social strategies of female chimpanzees, uh, which of course are a male phylopatric species. Uh, the young females have to uh, leave their natal group around the time that they reach sexual maturity and find a new group to join. Um, and when they join these new groups, they experience a lot of hostility, at least uh, receive a lot of aggression from the resident females. Um, and one of the ways that they mitigate the amount of aggression that they receive is they form relationships um, with uh, males who then intervene on their behalf uh, when they have conflicts uh, with the resident females. So kind of interesting uh, when you think about this female phylopatric species, but if you essentially lose your natal group, which is your mother, um, adolescent females are sort of forced into social dispersal uh, in a way that we wouldn't expect of a female phylopatric species but they're now having to establish their own um, home range without any social support at all. So it's rather interesting that they sort of turn to males instead of other females to spend a lot of time with. Um, I wanted to talk in a little bit more detail about the associations with, uh, between adolescent females and flanged males. Um, you see a lot of similar behavior like what I talked about with the unflanged males, general affiliation, very occasional grooming, which is very exciting because we almost never see uh, grooming behavior in orangutans. Um, 
friendly inspecting, uh, showing a food interest, similar instances of tolerated food theft, um, where the female taking food from the male, but he uh, it seems to be perfectly okay with it. Um, but what was really fascinating about these associations and how they differed from those with unflanged males um, is even though the unflanged male associations were super affiliative um, and a lot of uh, sort of familiar behavior was, was displayed, um, I never actually saw any mating take place in those associations. Adolescents and these unflanged males might associate for days and sometimes weeks at a time, but I actually never saw any mating. It doesn't mean adolescents don't ever mate with unflanged males. It was just not in this particular data set and not over the course of, of my time in the field. Um, but I did see mating between adolescents uh, and flanged males. And not only did they mate with flanged males, but their mating behavior was uh, very noteworthy. This is not your run-of-the-mill sort of uh, mating event. Um, if you know anything about orangutans, you may know that they're also kind of infamous for displaying really high rates of sexual coercion, um, specifically forced mating. They actually force um, the copulation events. Um, and so these interactions between adolescents and flanged males were particularly fascinating um, because they looked very different from mating events between adult females and flanged males. So here, this is not a super high quality uh, photo. It's basically a still shot from a video um, that I took during one of these mating events. Um, and you can see here, this is a flanged male. Um, his head is sort of tilted back. Both of his arms are sort of raised up over his head. He's, uh, in this picture, I think one hand is holding onto a branch and the other is sort of just free floating. Um, but his arms are up and his head is tilted back where he's sort of averting his gaze away from the female who you can't really tell here but is, is basically right in front of him uh, on the branch. Um, and what's fascinating about these interactions is I witnessed uh, many different sexual interactions between adolescent females and flanged males and this posture was basically held by the flanged male during each event. And again, I've never seen that in any mating event uh, with an adult female. So this is really bizarre because the male essentially holds that pose and sits completely still for the entire duration of the event. Um, and this is also weird. Orangutans are weird for lots of reasons, but uh, the average mating event for a chimpanzee, for example, uh, is seven seconds. Um, but these events between flanged males and adolescent females, um, the shortest one was 20 minutes. Uh, and the longest event went on for two hours. Um, everything, not just from sort of achieving intromission and performing thrusts, the male sits completely still the entire time, but the female performs 100% of the sexual behaviors. Um, both uh, sort of manual stimulation of the male, oral stimulation of the male, things that you certainly don't anticipate seeing uh, in non-humans, let alone in orangutans, um, and the female performing all of the thrusting behavior, and the male basically remains completely still. And as I said, one of these events went on like that, switching between all of these really elaborate behaviors for a full two hours. I actually got bored collecting data on a mating event, which I never thought possible because it happens so infrequently in orangutans. Um, really weird. What is going on here? This male could be, as we know for sure, is fully capable of forcing this female to mate. He's double her size. Um, they, they regularly force females to mate. Um, but instead, and he could be eating, he could be sleeping, he could be doing any, uh, any other activity essentially, but instead he's sitting completely still and sort of allowing this really long, elaborate interaction to take place. Um, which certainly raised a lot of questions for me. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was take a look at whether or not I was seeing just sort of a, a few really weird things going on or whether uh, this incredibly proceptive behavior on the part of these young females um, sort of held true throughout the database. Was I observing a really weird year and a couple of really weird adolescent females? Or do we actually see the adolescent female mating behavior is distinct from that of adult females. Um, and so I assigned each mating event uh, that we had in the database or had enough data on in the database uh, a mating score. So it's basically a score of one meant that the mating event was entirely resisted on the part of the female. So the scores are about the female's behavior. Um, meaning a score of one, she never uh, seemed cooperative or proceptive in any way. She just seemed to be trying to get away or was uh, acting in a, an aggressive manner towards the male as he uh, mated with her. 
whereas getting a score of 10 uh, indicated that the event was entirely proceptive, meaning the female um, was performing all of the behaviors and was trying to sort of engage in this, uh, this sexual event um, uh, as opposed to just sort of being receptive. A score of five would mean sort of purely just a, a receptive event. She was not resisting, but she was also not being proceptive. Um, and you can see uh, when you compare adolescent female mating events to those of adult females, um, adolescents are significantly more proceptive. Um, and so it was not necessarily just a fluke that I was seeing these really weird, um, really elaborate uh, interactions between adolescents and adult females. Um, this pattern was not immediately evident because sometimes there just aren't that many adolescent females in the study population. Um, but uh, it also seems to be restricted to not just any adolescent female, but kind of older adolescents. When they are essentially seem to be ready to conceive for the, fir for the first time, these events start taking place. Um, uh, it's not just at this study site. Um, it happens uh, across study sites. It's just been something that has uh, sort of gone under-documented. But adolescent females seem to have uh, distinct behavioral strategies when it comes to mating uh, in comparison to the adults. Um, so just to kind of summarize then some of the benefits that I have found so far uh, for these adolescent females to spend time with others. Um, who are they socializing with? And of course it is their mother. Um, so these females are going to reap whatever benefits we might expect of a female phylopatric species in general. Um, spending time with your mom means uh, more learning opportunities, sort of just observing her behavior and observing how she interacts with others, uh, figuring out how to be a successful member of your own species. Um, for orangutans, this is also a great opportunity. Uh, the only opportunity they really have to maybe practice their parenting behavior is when they associate with mom, they get to interact uh, with their younger sibling um, and, and figure out appropriate ways to interact with, uh, with infants and juveniles. Um, and then, of course, if they don't have the option of spending time with mom, they seem to be spending a lot of their time uh, with unflanged males, as I mentioned. Um, it remains to be seen exactly what benefits uh, these associations with unflanged males um, actually have. Uh, do those unflanged males, with these incredibly affiliative interactions with these females, do they end up siring their, their first offspring, perhaps? Uh, do those relationships persist over time? Um, I don't know yet. Uh, and want to kind of continue monitoring this population to hopefully start getting at uh, that question, to look at how long those relationships actually persist and what both individuals are getting out of them. Uh, what is the nature of the social events? As I mentioned, they're incredibly affiliative with the unflanged males. Um, and incredibly proceptive with the flanged males, like what I just got done describing. Um, as I said, orangutans are uh, known for being very sexually coercive. Um, and if you are an adolescent female, even though you are a female phylopatric species, once you achieve ranging independence from mom, you no longer have sort of consistent, um, constant social support that you see in other female phylopatric species that form more cohesive social groups. Uh, someone related to you is always there, and that is not the case um, for orangutans. So these adolescents have really distinctive social behavioral repertoires um, that seem to be focused on kind of navigating these potential social risks. Um, spending time with these flanged males in these really elaborate events um, is likely to serve both just overcoming uh, the ambivalence that adult males tend to show, uh, sort of young uh, nulliparous females across primates anyway. They're not particularly interesting to adult males uh, much of the time, and so maybe this is a way for an, a young female to sort of indicate to a flanged male that she is uh, able to conceive or is getting near the time that she's able to conceive. And at the same time, this flanged male is basically able to signal to this young female um, his non-coercive or sort of agreeable temperament, his, his non-coercive tendencies. Um, flanged males essentially, uh, they have kind of a sit and wait strategy when it comes to mating. They let out these really loud vocalizations in the forest and if females are interested, they come towards those loud vocalizations. Um, you can imagine in this context where sexual coercion is so common, um, females are able to identify individual males based on their long call 
And if these events um, are useful, perhaps this is a way that a flanged male can ensure that she comes towards his long call when she is able to conceive, rather than seeking out the company of some other flanged male. Uh, worth noting that the, the, the specific dyads that I observed engaging in these behaviors, there was never any overlap. The same um, adolescent female, I never actually saw engaging in these uh, elaborate rituals with a different flanged male. Again, it's possible that we're just not seeing it, but three different um, adolescent female flanged male dyads, they seem to keep to their specific flanged male, which is also really interesting. Um, so kind of all of these different results taken together, um, I think we can say adolescence is really challenging, uh, no matter your species. Um, this is particularly so with a really socially dispersed female Philopatric species, again, because of that loss of this constant social support that you might have um, uh, if you are any other sort of more cohesive species. Um, and certainly in an environment where sexual coercion is so common, how do these young females kind of navigate this really dispersed social landscape and also ensure that they will have some ability to choose who they end up mating with or who ends up siring their offspring? Um, currently, I continue to monitor the, uh, the parasites in this population. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the results thus far were not supporting uh, my hypothesis that increased social contact would lead to increased parasite infection. Um, but as I said, uh, foraging conditions were incredibly favorable, sort of notably favorable um, during my data collection period. Um, and so we're now looking at what has been uh, sort of a very non-masting few years. Um, and do we end up seeing differences amongst the age sex classes uh, when they are a little bit more nutritionally stressed and also less social. Um, I'm also uh, interested in looking at the physiological mechanisms that underlie these changes in social behavior. Um, in particular, I'm really interested in the transition between adolescence and adulthood. Um, when you look at orangutans uh, in particular, you have this really, really social period um, that characterizes adolescence. Uh, not just uh, interacting with other individuals, but also really distinctive sexual behavior. And everything really changes once you have your first offspring. And I'm interested in looking at sort of how stress hormones might interact with reproductive hormones and how they might interact with uh, hormones of social bonding um, to produce really distinctive behavioral strategies across the lifespan. Um, similarly, I'm interested in how early maternal stress, particularly in a species that experiences these periodic, really extreme periods of food shortage, um, what effect does that have on sort of the timing of offspring development? Um, and then also, in particular, the timing and the nature of achieving ranging independence. Who's kind of responsible for initiating uh, that period of independence that can be really challenging, uh, potentially for both mother and offspring? Um, so yeah, that's um, sort of a, a summary of my research. I just want to acknowledge certainly um, all of uh, the, the funders and certainly the Indonesian field team that is always out there collecting data um, that I have the privilege of being able to tap into. Um, and certainly I want to acknowledge uh, Tim Lehman and, and Robert Suro who uh, provide me with the majority of the orangutan photographs. It was a really nice photograph. It was almost certainly not mine. Um, it was belonged to either Tim or Robert. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you, wonderful talk. Um, I, um, well, I have a couple of questions. Maybe I'll just ask one right now. Um, and that is, isn't it the case that in zoos, where there's no nutritional stress, that orangutans can be quite sociable? And doesn't that indicate then that this, it's not like some species in which an aversion to conspecifics is like built into the psychology. This is something that's very flexible, right? It is very flexible. So in captivity, though, even the interactions are still different. They're much more social and much more interactive than you typically see in the wild. Um, but there's still a difference, generally, compared to if you're 
if you go to the chimpanzee enclosure and then you go to the orangutan enclosure, there's something a bit different about the way that they interact. Um, both sort of the frequency of interacting. Um, there's way less uh, vocalizing between individuals. Um, and there's just not a whole lot of touching um, in ways other than perhaps sort of sitting in contact. Grooming certainly occurs more frequently in captivity, but not anything that approaches basically any other primate species that you would look at. So there still is certainly a difference. I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing that orangutans, you know, ta-da, they're actually super social and they're just so, they, they just can't come together sometimes. There is a difference certainly in their social attraction, I think, but they absolutely have the capacity to be more social and if you go to the LA Zoo, you can certainly see that. Um, thank you for a great talk. I was wondering about the different uh, types of parasites you tested for and and the differences, and I don't, I don't know anything about it, but them, and whether there are differences in the life histories in those, in those different parasites in regards to how they're transmitted, and then how that might affect the role of sociality and the transmission of those. those Certainly. Parasites. So great question. So some of those um, are basically soil transmitted helminths, things that we expect to be transmitted socially. Um, particularly one of them is like enterobius, which is like a pinworm. Um, which is very frequently, like just through physical contact, is transmitted. The others might be transmitted if you come into contact with soil, but also just coming into contact with other individuals. A lot of, the, um, uh, of those worms can actually go through the skin, um, and, and that's how you get infected. They actually burrow through your skin. Um, and so some of the others, uh, like uh, entamoeba, is something more probably you have to ingest that from like contaminated food, water, or, or you know, maybe having something on your hand, and then, but basically you're ingesting that. Um, but the contact parasites are especially what we might expect. Arguably both kinds, both ways of transmission, um, being more social or living at higher densities is going to increase your risk of just coming into contact with them. Um, but certainly you'd, it's easier to make predictions about the, the soil transmitted, the worms basically, things that can uh, through physical contact be transmitted. Uh, and it's worth noting, I, I, I forgot to sort of mention it here, um, all of those parasites, so basically everyone kind of had everything, um, and I was kind of taken aback at how many parasites I saw in every single sample. I never looked at a single sample that didn't have loads of parasites in it. Um, and this was unexpected to me, mostly because it's a pretty uh, kind of pristine habitat as far as orangutan habitat goes. It's primary rainforest. Um, with relatively low levels of kind of human disturbance within the, certainly within the study site. Um, but these individuals are tolerating these, these loads rather well. I mean, I think I saw diarrhea, I'd have to look back at my notes, but probably twice of like 200 samples that I collected. Individuals are not experiencing diarrhea as a result of these loads. Um, everyone was in really good body condition. Uh, but again, this was like a really sort of favorable foraging period. So everyone was in really good condition overall. Um, it's when you are compromised in other ways that any one of the parasites that I mentioned can become uh, deadly um, and, and, and highly pathogenic, but they're really tolerating these loads, at least under these really favorable conditions. So, thanks for the talk. I'm kind of following up on that a little bit. Um, so, you had two measures of anxiety behavioral and a physiological measure. And you're absolutely right that across the primate and the, the mammalian literature, self-directed behavior is taken as an index of anxiety. Um, but it's possible that both in your own data set and in some of the others that you're taking as kind of benchmarks in this regard, <clears throat> there's a conflation there of two causes of scratching behavior. Um, one is anxiety, mm -hmm. and the other is um, contagious transmission of scratching by virtue of others' behavior constituting a cue of active parasite presence. So um, I believe, and we were just talking about this the other day, that um, contagious scratching has been documented in what I'm done. Um, and the, I mean, there are different explanations for this. Franz Paul has an idea about empathy, which is consistent with his general worldview of apes. Um, there's a more parsimonious explanation, in my opinion, which is that this is just a cue of um, the presence of parasites. And um, uh, uh, 
in that case, you wouldn't expect um, scratching behavior to necessarily correlate with cortisol levels, mm -hmm. which, if I recall your data correctly, that is what you found. Correct. That is, they seem orthogonal. Um, now, cortisol, time course matters, other events in the individual's you know, recent past can affect it. Um, there are a bunch of things that might be causing noise in cortisol data. But all else being equal, if we had to you know, sort of put money on which of those two was going to be a better indicator of stress, I think a lot of people would vote for cortisol um, uh, over this more overdetermined feature of behavior. For sure. So it might be worth going back and looking at your data um, and separating out scratching behavior from other aspects of contagious behavior, like yawning, where yawning arguably is a better index of anxiety, right? And seeing whether um, scratching might be explicable in other terms. So. Yes, I, I would like to look back at this data for a few reasons. Um, the, the idea of contagion would, I don't think I'm seeing that here, but I, I would definitely need to take a look at it, is like when I'm, uh, if rates of self-directed behavior t were taken simultaneously, not just the focal I was focused on, but also another individual, which I don't have a ton of those, um, the adolescent females seem to start scratching so noticeably um, when they are in association, particularly with flanged males, um, whereas the other individuals are not scratching at all. Um, the flanged males, like, basically not scratching. Um, and interestingly, yawning is, like, almost not in the data set. Um, it was something I was also recording, but maybe a handful of, of yawns in these situations. So it definitely... Uh, warrants further, like sort of looking further into this, and especially, I mean, the idea that the scratching behavior is also argued to be sort of ameliorating the stress that you're experiencing, so you might not see it's sort of this behavioral, potentially a behavioral manifestation of anxiety, you're not going to see it result in elevated levels of cortisol because it's sort of fixing the anxiety. Um, and so it's very complicated, I think. Uh, a really simple behavior is actually much more nuanced, I think, than we have appreciated, and it absolutely warrants taking a closer look. Both, I think, the parallel, like self-directed behavior follows, can at least get at the contagion question, um, and also looking, separating out scratching versus self-grooming versus yawning, will, is meaningful potentially. Thank you. So I was just wondering, um, we could talk a little bit more about the adult females mm -hmm. and the stress, because if I remember correctly, they're cortisol levels were overall higher, but they didn't show an interaction with sociality, is that right? Uh, they did. So when they are social, their, their cortisol levels were significantly higher. Than when they went not social. When they, then when they were not social. Okay, but yeah. they were across the board. And across the board, they're okay. higher than everybody else. So I was just wondering how that um, might interact with the presence of infants. Mm -hmm. and, you know, whether you had any variation in the age of the infants and the adult females, you know, particularly thinking about how often they were aggressive towards their um, adolescent daughters mm -hmm. who were approaching them. And so, you know, if you could just maybe talk a little bit about... About those differences. Yeah, about the kind of role that, that having a dependent infant on you might play and thinking about the stresses. Exactly. So, essentially, uh, these adult females and also flanged males, their, their cortisol levels were also significantly affected by being in association. And these are the two age sex classes that you sort of expect to basically have the highest like metabolic demands. Um, they're bigger. Uh, certainly flanged males are bigger than unflanged males. Flanged males are just huge in general, and they have these just big pads of fat on the sides of their face. Um, they have really high metabolic demands. Uh, similarly, as a female orangutan, once you have reproduced, you're basically always either pregnant or lactating. Uh, one or the other, both of which have pretty high metabolic demands. Um, so cortisol, of course, is an indicator of, of psychosocial stress, arguably, but also of just energetic stress. Um, and it can be challenging to tease those two things apart. Um, and certainly here, it seems that being social is not 
necessarily eliciting like anxiety per se in the adult females, but that they're experiencing sort of their foraging behavior is, uh, is potentially compromised. So they're not able to forage as efficiently or as well when they're in association with others and they're actually experiencing social behavior in a negative way in, in this particular physiological measure. Um, same thing with, with flanged males. It's been shown in, in other studies that when flanged males are spending time with other individuals and they're coordinating their, their behavior, uh, their, their day path length is significantly longer. So spending time with individuals is actually like an energetic burden and you're actually seeing that sort of manifested in these cortisol levels uh, in these sort of otherwise more burdened individuals in the first place. Um, adolescent females and unflanged males seem to be able to afford, energetically speaking, these higher rates of association, whereas adult females and flanged males can't afford it as well. So that's one possible causal pathway, mm -hmm. but isn't it also possible that if, if there's ecological stress, that that's forcing them to have to forage closer to others than they would otherwise want to? So it's not the sociality that's really triggering the, the higher um, stress, it's that they are energetically stressed, and so then they have to become social. But the sociality is like a byproduct or a side effect. It's not actually causal. So when we look at, it, I didn't show this data here, but reduced food availability, particularly really low fruit periods, are associated with significantly reduced degrees of social encounters. So when fruit is low, they're not socializing, um, generally. So this idea that like, oh, they're coming together in, well, if there's only a single tree fruiting, that that's when they're coming together, that's not really what's happening. Um, they are avoiding each other uh, when they can't afford to come together, essentially. Um, and that's true for all of the age sex classes. All of their social behavior is reduced, um, just less so for adolescent females, uh, when fruit availability is really low. Can I ask a follow-up to the follow-up? <laughs> so, I was just wondering whether you had, um, you know, it, so just elaborating on one of the things you said, that sociality um, might be associated with lower rates of feeding for some in some cases. And mm -hmm. So I wanted to know whether you had other um, measures of like ingestion rate or vigilance or, you know, basically is it being driven by, you know, f especially in the adult females, like I have an infant and you're close to me, so I'm paying more attention to you, so I'm spending less time feeding, or is it about the sort of social coordination and you're spending more time doing, you know, other possibly positive things? Mm -hmm. um, I've not looked at it yet in for adult females. We know for flanged males that when they're in association with others, um, that their feeding time is reduced. Um, they're spending a lot more time traveling and less time feeding, engaging in sort of other positive behaviors, uh, probably mating or sort of courting um, behaviors. Uh, we don't know yet, uh, but that, that data certainly exists for adult females and is, is one of many next steps. Um, I was wondering, is there a reason that you chose to use urinary cortisol over like, fecal glucocorticoids? Um, would imagine have like a longer or have a greater ability to capture that like previous day? Um, Arguably, it's, it, urine is actually better for that, um, but also the, the samples that I actually used for this data set were historical samples. Um, uh, the, and we don't collect, basically we don't collect feces for, for hormones at all. It's sort of all done out of urine. Um, as I said, this, that data set was actually from, um, if I recall, it was like 90, 1994 through 2009. Um, those samples were, so that's kind of what existed. Um, but it is thought that sort of that first morning urine is the best indication of, of what was going on the day before, arguably. But um, yeah, we don't take uh, hormones out of the fecal samples at all at, at this particular field site. Uh, really fantastic. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that um, the, the work that you've pulled together with, with these very hard one data is fantastic. Um, and what, one of the things that struck me with this is that when you describe the, the associations and mating associations between adolescent females and other males, um, the degree of fidelity between individuals in these dyads mm -hmm. um, at the level of 
behavioral uh, observation, you know, it's, it, it seems to be like social monogamy almost, in the sense that they're, um, you know, relatively stable in, in, in the males that they're uh, meeting with. And I'm, I'm just wondering how that compares to what we know about adult females, either from behavioral data or from genetic data, the degree of exclusivity that you observe. Is it, is it much greater than what we think is happening with adult females? Um, and also why? Sure. That's the big question too, is like why, since that's a big you know, mm -hmm. issue in evolutionary anthropology is understanding the context in which social monogamy expressed or varies, what are the kinds of contextual or other features that we think might be contributing? Sure. Uh, great question. So with adult females, they are like for sure promiscuous maters. Um, they are, now there does seem to be variation at different sites, um, particularly on Sumatra. Uh, there is kind of a really evident like dominant flanged male um, that you know, females within that sort of have their home ranges within his massive home range seek him out specifically when they're getting harassed by other males. Whereas on Borneo, and there's sort of a, a, a scale, kind of like a gradation across the island as well, um, you have many more flanged males in study areas. Uh, there's f just fewer flanged males in general on Sumatra, and then in Borneo you have lots of flanged males. So potentially sort of more options available. Um, and you see for sure an adult female uh, over the course of uh, kind of before conceiving mates with many different males, um, both flanged uh, and unflanged. And what previous data has shown is that they seem to concentrate their cooperative mating with flanged males during the periconceptive period, so the periovulatory period. Um, so around the time of ovulation, they're kind of seeking out flanged males and mating very cooperatively with them. When they're outside of that periovulatory period, they are mating cooperatively with unflanged males. So again, the chain, it's different what we so historically sort of thought, well, unflanged males force mate, flanged males don't have to force mate because females like them. It's much more complicated and, and nuanced than that, and both types of males force mate um, and, and both types of males also you know have cooperative uh, events. Seems to be that they the females are concentrating paternity um, in the flanged males um, but they are also uh, arguably confusing paternity by by mating plenty uh, and cooperatively with unflanged males occasionally as well. Um, oh I just sort of lost so, a part of your question. Yeah, I, could, I could maybe refresh yeah. and then kind of interject here. So the, the associations between the adolescent females and the males that you observe, your, your description of what we know about horny orangs is, is that they're, they're meeting with more males mm -hmm. actually across that, oh, yeah. the, 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 the entire period prior to their first reproduction. So do you think that what you just saw was kind of just one segment of a longer series of meetings they would have had with other males? So. Or what before mating, for, so before their like first conception, um, we've argued this actually. There's a, a an infanticide, sort of a revisiting of the risk of infanticide in orangutans came out of a few months ago in scientific reports, um, and one of the arguments that we made is that because of sort of male ambivalence towards young females, um, that arguably these young adolescent females aren't able to confuse paternity because they have to invest this like these really, really time consuming events and sort of following around a particular flanged male just to kind of get him interested. Um, again, I didn't really have time to get into it here, but the these adolescent females and the, the, the flanged male that they engage in these really elaborate behaviors with for years follow that male a lot and he is totally disinterested um, for the first few years. She follows him like pretty nervously um, where she's the one sort of initiating um, the association and she's the one f like performing the following behavior. Um, but if he kind of moves like in her direction, she backs up and then continues to follow him. And she's sort of anxiously following this male around um, periodically for, for years before all of the sudden 
these incredible, like really elaborate events start taking place. Um, and so one, the argument that we have made is that they, they would confuse paternity if they were able to. Um, and that's something that's something adult females are sort of able to do um, because they are much more desirable to, to males and that males in generally are really disinterested in these young females. And even though uh, they, they start sort of presenting um, sexually to flanged males uh, at, a, at a younger age, they're like total, almost totally ignored basically until seemingly right before they're able to conceive for the first time. Following up on that point, um, I mean, you mentioned the adult males' lack of interest in melliferous females across primates, and I mean, this is understandable given that conception rates are low, mm -hmm. um, parturition rates are low, um, you know, infant survival is low. For, mm -hmm. uh, so across the board, it's just a bad bet. Right. Um, I mean, that in some ways explains. You, you, so you mentioned the opportunity cost to the male of these prolonged mating events um, for the flange male. Um, and, and certainly that's a fixed cost in this situation. But given that the flanged males are subject to, um, you know, substantial energy balance considerations, their passivity in this interaction is completely understandable, right? If their expected rate of return is pretty low on this interaction, then um, basically tolerance plus opportunity cost is the minimum that they have to pay, and they don't pay any more than that. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe they get an offspring out of it, maybe they don't, but they're minimizing their costs. Right? Certainly. Um, at the same time, the, the length of these, is, it's just so, it's such a long time, it's so prolonged, um, that it's just really bizarre. And it's not clear, a question I often get is like, well, does the, does the male ejaculate? Yeah. And it's hard to say. Uh, it's not obvious, certainly, in orangutans. Um, so it's uh, in many of the associations, it's assumed that he did, um, but not necessarily. Um, and so he is able to sort of minimize these things, but at the same time, the like it's, the other females that are around are not like that far essentially. Um, and the fact that they kind of tolerate this this young female around them for so long, I mean, they, they really sort of get in their faces too. Um, and potentially kind of like interrupt feeding, and we know that they're they're sort of losing feeding time by having these associations, um, and so the male does seem to be gaining something from from sort of being a willing participant in in, in these events, and and like I said, remains to be seen. Do is it is it these unflanged males that eventually sire these offspring, or is it the the flanged males that eventually sire offspring? And is it more of a long game with the flanged males because? It, depending on how long that flanged male is able to sort of maintain his, his prime status, it may be, you know, several reproductive events that she lives in his territory or near his territory and seeks him out instead of somebody else. But we just don't know yet. It's following up on that, I mean, it, it, it may be that his, uh, the opportunity costs are less when it's a period of substantial resource abundance, right? So, um, uh, he's willing to lose that 20 minutes, two hours, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's plenty of food around and um, he's not going to have to travel a long way to get to it. Um, and if you were to study the same population during a period of resource stress, then you might be much less tolerant of that because the opportunity costs rise. Absolutely, which is probably part of why we've seen this, like why this was sort of so mind-boggling, <laughs> certainly for me, but even um, you know, my, my PhD advisor had never seen anything, anything like these, uh, these events. Of course, there have been the only published reports of similar events, and they're like pretty much identical, are from uh, Sumatra uh, in the early 80s. Um, uh, Sherman published on, uh, essentially, he talked about a single dyad, but again, the same sort of thing. There was some fidelity in, in the dyad, um, and it seemed to start taking place right before she conceived. Um, and, uh, and then anecdotally, like, or just basically, I, I polled other orangutan researchers to see if they see anything similar. And at some sites, like, we've never actually seen that. It just seems to be the exact, all conditions sort of have to be perfect. Fruit availability has to be high. You basically have to have a sufficient number of adolescent females in your population that you happen to be there on, you know, on these days that this is taking place. 
So it seems to be a phenomenon that's happening across orangutans, but it's, it's relatively rare. Um, and so it's, it's consistent, but rare. So, you know, why I was able to sort of say, wow, this is this really cool thing happening. It's definitely not brand new, um, but uh, a lot of people haven't had the chance to, to see these events. Just following up on that and maybe speculating a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, first, it, it seems like you were saying that that when females are harassed, sometimes they'll go to flanged males for protection. Is that, is that yeah? Basically, flanged males can uh, scare away an unflanged male, you know, instantly. Yeah. So I wonder if you know whether that then that there's some sort of um, you know aspect of male choice in determining whether they want to defend females in those circumstances, and and if there are these kinds of long-term associations between flanged males and females. The, you know, it seems like the juvenile females would be, you know, are paying opportunity costs also in, in these long interactions and whether, you know, that, that you know, I mean, it's a, I, presumably the, the opportunity costs aren't huge, but if, if that signals some sort of, you know, quality, whether that encourages the male to protect the female in, in future interactions going forward. Into Potentially. Um, so. Again, with orangutans, every, the, the sample size of all, so many events are so small, that it's really hard to know what's going on. But um, so we don't frequently, uh, the first sort of uh, instance of um, coalitionary killing just a couple years ago at a, at a neighboring field site um, on Borneo, um, where a female, two females who had sort of uh, historically seemed to not like each other, at least. Every time they came into contact with each other, there was um, sort of vaguely hostile behavior and like avoidant behavior generally. Um, but then all of a sudden, um, this is a, a Marzek, I want to say 2015 or 2013, uh, this, this account is published. It's really, really interesting, um, especially because of the coalitionary behavior, which, what the heck, uh, for orangutans, you had, a, um, it, was an, it was an unflanged male sort of got involved in this conflict between two females and started uh, acting incredibly aggressive, attacking um, the one female, basically on behalf of, of, the, of the aggressor. Um, they, they eventually like succeeded in killing this female, but it was like day over days, maybe I forget, weeks of like repeated attacks on this female. And at some point, a flanged male came in and intervened on behalf of the victim. It, his, his intervention was too late. She had already sustained like really, really severe injuries over the course of many days. Um, but really interesting that these males got involved in this conflict between two females and, uh, you know, one with deadly violence and the other too late, but certainly would have had the potential to save that female because, as I said, flanged males are always uh, uh, dominant to unflanged males. And so he, if, had he sort of appeared sooner um, or had she maybe been able to get to him sooner, maybe none of that would have, would have happened. So again, while rare, the, the, there is the potential for sort of deadly violence from conspecifics that females may very well be really benefiting from these associations with different kinds of males and maybe even with you know, their, their mothers potentially. Uh, so I have a, a question and then a kind of sort of meta-theoretical reflection. So the question is about um, the, the um, social intelligence hypothesis, that, mm -hmm. so orangutans has, you know, fairly large brain, but, but semi-solitary, mm -hmm. so but then the reflection is that um, it has to do with the whole, the, the defi what we mean by a social relationship, and so, so, you know, 40 years ago, Robert Hine defined a, a dyadic social relationship as a pattern series of social interactions, mm -hmm. and that, of course, is easy, an easy definition fairly easy for us as analysts to use, it's an operational definition. But of course we know that social relationships can exist, if you think about it, humans, in the complete absence of any social interaction for many years, sure. because it's an internal representation. The two people think about themselves having a relationship and, and so it persists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so um, in a certain sense, the, the Heindian operational definition sort of falls way short of the reality. And I, when I think about orangutans, I think about this. That, so that, that that's well, and I think that's a it's a great point. And I was just talking about this with Katrina. I think there there are these anecdotal things that happen that really raise these questions about about relationships between orang like these long term 
relationships that are maintained despite maybe very limited actual interaction. Um, I, I said I don't even know what to do with this particular ev event, but um, uh, males are generally very intolerant of one another. Um, flanged males like basically do not tolerate one another at all. If they encounter each other, it's, it's hostile um, until one chases the other away or they fight. Um, Whereas there's occasional sort of tolerance of uh, by flanged males of unflanged males. If like a, a conceptive female is not around, um, they will like tolerate him sort of hanging out. Um, I saw this one event where two males, one flanged and one arguably like flanging. He was like slightly developed. His cheek pads were like, we say two finger widths. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, one of them was in a group with uh, multiple females. A flanged male came by, so he got to the ground and ran away. I followed him. He then got in a tree with another male. They spent time grooming each other. Um, one laid his head in the other's lap, and they just stroked each other's faces for about 15 minutes while I stood under them, like, just completely dumbfounded. Um, that's just not behavior that we thought would ever, ever take place between adult males. Clearly they knew each other, and clearly there was some pre-existing relationship there. I, and then they separated, and we'll never know anything about it again. You know, it's just so, it's so strange. But yes, I think there's, there are these sort of meaningful relationships taking place at just this really dispersed level, and it makes it difficult, if not impossible, for us on the ground to actually appreciate what's, what's going on and what's going on in, in their minds, certainly. So I was just wondering, um, thinking back to the, what you were saying about the different time periods of adolescent females, um, or maybe, maybe it was all females, but having uh, cooperative matings with flanged males versus unflanged males, and mm -hmm. I was wondering whether there was any sort of protective effect against coercive mating. So if you mate with a male cooperatively at any time period, are you less likely to receive coercive mating attempts from him? From him later. Um, if I, you have that data, if anyone has that data. Yeah, I think that, so the data, it probably, the data exists, but it's probably patchy. Um, and it's a great question. It's like, are you, so no one's really looked at sort of the familiarity aspect. Like, yeah, are, are you less likely to resist males that you encounter more, basically? Um, is like one, is a question that I'm interested in that it's not really been looked at yet. But it does seem the mixture of behaviors that takes place, even in a single mating event, um, just makes it really challenging even, that's why coming up with this sort of way to uh, assign a mating score is to hopefully account for the variation that we see because a female might be really receptive to a mating event at first and then decide halfway through she starts trying to get away and starts becoming aggressive or vice versa, a male will start sort of uh, forcing the event and, and partway through, you know, she actually like displays a few proceptive behaviors and it's they're always really mixed and it's really challenging. Some, some are obvious, some like events get scores of ones or get scores of 10. Um, but in most there's like an interesting combination and so no male is sort of uniformly, you know, cooperated with or and no male is uniformly resisted. Um, and even though we have seen in the past that, that pattern of sort of seeming concentrating paternity in flanged males, it's just way more nuanced than that. And, and there's so much variation that I wish we could say we, we understood. So 